Hello, everyone. Welcome. It is Wednesday again. It's time for the Topher Spin Meteorite Hangout. Um, <coughs> great way to start. Sorry about that. It is January 27th, 2021, and we got a little bit of a good conversation going on already, so I figured let's hit the record button and get this stuff captured. Um, really interesting treat for us today. We have a new international um, collector who's a friend of ours uh, who submitted a video for us. It's a 12-minute video, and it's a, it's a uh, look at his entire collection not in detail of each piece, but an overview. He's quite a collector, and he he, um, he is in Amsterdam area, so he focuses on European falls and finds, um, which are usually old and rare and hard to get. So he has quite a collection. Um, so we we welcome Andre to the to the uh, video friends. Um, so we have a check-in with him, a check-in with Marco, and also uh, Maxime. Um, but I, I want to answer something. I want to address something that we talked about, we brought up last week, and we didn't close loop on it. <clears throat> someone raised a question about cleaning chondrites. And someone put a comment in the video, hey, you guys never finished talking about cleaning chondrites. Um, so I apologize. Uh, let's talk about cleaning chondrites. I don't know much about it, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to the group in a second. I'm sure Pat may have some information, but I haven't been in the game long enough. I don't buy older stock. I, I don't buy lots of stuff that have been sitting around for a while. So I don't, ha I don't have old chondrites that are rusty or that need to be cleaned. Uh, I do brush clean some stuff when I get it. Um, obviously, if there's fusion crust on it, I'm not going to mess with it. Um, there are some ways you can, if there's caliche on it, you can soak it in vinegar, certain types of meteorites, you can soak in vinegar, and that will um, attack the caliche and soften it up. Uh, you can also put it in an ultrasonic cleaner uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, distilled water. Um, and besides that, as far as removing rust off the surface of a chondrite. I'm gonna open it up and ask the group, does anyone else have any information to offer about that? It's not something I've run into really. Well, uh, I have heard of uh, some dealers uh, getting fairly drastic with that. Uh, there's a, uh, a product called uh, uh, LCR, LCR or something. CLR? Uh, yeah, Calcium CLR. Calcium lime yeah, rust? CLR. Yeah, uh, which I think is basically lye, um, L-Y-E, the chemical. Um, but I advocate for doing as little as possible and being as careful as possible. Um, you know, if you use water only distilled or uh, DI slash uh, 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 reverse osmosis so that you yeah. know, you've just got water um, high proof uh, isopropyl alcohol 91% uh, if that's all you can get 99.9 .9 if, if you can get it and, it and you can get it off eBay it's just or uh, Amazon it's just expensive um, but yeah that and a soft toothbrush and maybe an ultrasonic cleaner but I I, I, do, I don't do much at all for cleaning um, meteorites period Thank I you, talk about CLR a little bit. Uh, it's it's pretty aggressive against caliche. It'll remove it all. So if you got any caliche on it, uh, I've used it on a couple of irons, and it, it does a great job as far as getting rid of rust and lime. If you want to take it down to base metal, but if you want to keep the caliche, do not use CLR. Okay, uh, and also just a, a note that any sample that's being sent to the lab for classification purposes, do not mess with it. Do not do anything. It They get it as you get it. Don't You don't need to mess with it. Um, Some of these solutions can leave uh, a small film, uh, a, a, a whitish film, if you don't totally remove it, clean it totally from the meteorite, and mm -hmm. it will forever be there. So, you yeah. know, experiment on a sacrificial piece, not your main piece. Yeah, you know, if you have that. 
That's a that's a really good that's a really good point, Arthur. Um, obviously, uh, the person who was asking the question said they went to their storage and found that that they had a bunch. So I would the, the thing is, if you have a bunch, grab a few, try a few methods on them. Do one with um, when you're using a brush or anything abrasive. A rule of thumb is never use anything harder than the surface you're cleaning. So if you're cleaning um, an iron meteorite, don't use a stainless steel brush. I've always wondered. I haven't played around with it at all, but they uh, they sell those like laser cleaners for like uh, metal work, and they're getting cheaper and cheaper. And I wonder if that would be a viable option if you had like a pin laser like that for uh, removing the oxidation on them. Yeah, I don't know if I, I've, I've seen that. Uh, I've, I've seen those things, and and uh, I have to admit that I don't understand how they work and i puzzled about how they work but uh you know i think the overarching uh comment here and it's one that toper uh made that but i think needs to be emphasized uh if you do any sort of intensive chemical cleaning on a meteorite you're going to affect its scientific value now oh, you sure. may you may not affect its collector value but at that point uh uh you know, from a from a lab work uh, or chemistry or uh, microprobe sort of uh, standpoint, you have altered the meteorite, and it's no longer a pristine scientific object. So, uh, you know, should you go careful with it? I I, I know of one dealer I won't name him uh, who uh, has moved a lot of Gal meteorites, and he's used very very strong chemicals to remove the. Uh, the rust and caliche from them and they come out looking like fresh uh freshly crusted meteorites uh and that's okay if all you want to do is look at them but that they lose their scientific importance or value at that point mm -hmm. and, and as a dealer to to piggyback on that as a dealer i would disclose that personally um whenever i sell something that was treated by someone or cut by someone or polished by someone where appropriate i pass that information along if i've treated the piece personally if i've done anything to it i'm way overboard in disclosing that because that's not my specialty as you guys saw last week with my burnt acid uh acid edge <laughs> piece <laughs> Oh, by the way, I, I figured out a possible excuse. <laughs> I don't know if it's the reason or not, but a good excuse is uh, going through the, the garage, organizing the, the chemicals, checking your expiration dates. Uh, that nitric acid, uh, nitol, had expired two years ago. Oh, oh, nitol expires? Really? Well, mine did two years ago, so you might want to check the date oh. on yours. Um, in that case, don't overbuy. A um, <laughs> little a quick shout out to a friend we're missing today. Oz, we're thinking about you. Sorry you couldn't make it today. Um, I do want to go right to Ron because Ron <laughs> Metchus has been waiting what? impatiently. I was going to say waiting patiently, but it hasn't been patient. No, <laughs> All right, let me get it set up here. Okay, ready. Yeah, that okay. is gorgeous. This is uh, this is the uh, the turgot I've been waiting for for thirty seven days. Actually, was it Pat? Somebody um, had one that went seventy four days. So I guess he holds the record. I'm not sure. I, I forget who it was. What's anyway, the name? Of, what's the name of this? And how do you spell is, it, please? Uh, turgut. T T U R G U T. Thank you. It's, it's, it's out of, uh, let me see. It's Turkey. Uh, Turkey, I think, it's yeah. Out of Turkey, Konya, Turkey. Um, anyway, this is 177 grams. Uh, Konya is K-O-N-Y-A. This is 177 grams. It's a finest octahedrite, which has to do with the space between the lamellae, I think it is, or camasite, whatever it is. Um, so I got this uh, just a few days ago, and I've been uh, kind of playing with it and, you know, doing all my little, you know, documentation things. Um, it's gorgeous, man. about today is I'm, I'm showing this on my cell phone camera, which is the first time I've done this, to get a, a much sharper picture. 
So, uh, you know, my usual webcam is kind of fuzzy. But this one, yeah, no, this, nice. this looks really, really good. And the etch and the pattern on oh, this yeah. is just yeah, crazy it, beautiful. It looks three-dimensional. Yeah. So, yeah uh, you're sharing your cell phone to your laptop. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, what it is. Um, okay. Um, can I I'll, let me talk about the app a little bit. Yeah, so I have, an Android, I have an Android phone. Yep. So I went online. I started searching for ways to hook it up to my computer. You get a much better picture. Um, so there is this app called uh, uh, DroidCam. Uh, it, it's in the Play Store. Um, there's two versions. There's a free version, which has advertising. It gives a decent picture, but you don't have any control over the camera. You can't turn the, you can't turn the flash on. You can't rotate. It's just a basic picture. Uh, so I popped for the $4.99 for the paid version. I think I can afford that my budget, um, which gives you control over zoom, autofocus, uh, mirror imaging, rotating. Um, you can take a picture as a JPEG, but I haven't figured out quite how to do that yet. Um, so it, it gives you, the, uh, you have to have on, uh, on your computer, okay, the, the Droid Cam is the app for your phone. So there's there's a, there's a sister program that you have to have on your computer, uh, which is free download. Um, it's the client, so you have to have both running, and it's a wireless hookup. It's not UPS, although it, it has the UPS hookup USB. capability or USB. Yeah, um, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> whatever. As a guy who works in tech, it hurt my ears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. Um, uh, I haven't figured out the, the uh, USB hookup yet, but the, the um, it, it's got a high def version or a high def feature, which I'm using right now. And you go low def, you know, the higher def you go, the more information you're transmitting. So a little bit of a time lag, um, or the, maybe half a second. So Does it uh, have 3D capability? 3D? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm asking for too much, I know. Uh, I doubt it has 3D. It's, it's your basic, just hook your camera up to your computer, basically, right. wirelessly. Right. But actually, it, it's doing a very nice job. Excellent. So Close. I want to turn this over and show the other side. This is, I think, the nicer side. This one has some smaller inclusions. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. That is beautiful. Sweet. So it's, um, it's a very nice piece wow. there. Wow. That was well um, worth the wait, Ron. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy's got a few more slices out there. This is one of their, his cheaper slices since they get a little pricey, a little spendy. Nice Irons get heavy. That is fusion crust. Pardon me. Nice thick slab with fusion. fusion yeah, crust. It's, it's got it's got crust on on uh, you know every surface except the cut side. Um, let me see if I can get that highlight a little bit here. The focus will let me do this. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I got to work this time lag here. I, okay. Yeah, there's there's the crust right there. Nice, yeah. nice. It's all, all the way around. So it's um, you know, so uh, I would wow. to. So far, this is uncoated, so I don't see any rust on it. Um, I was going to spray with that uh, automotive uh, clear coat finish. We're we're getting a lot of rain today, and partially a lot of humidity in the air. So I'm going to wait till the weather dries out before I do that because I don't want to trap any moisture in the rock. Um, but right now, it seems to be hanging in there pretty well. I don't see any before, rust. It has, it has before been. you would spray that with uh, with the clear coat, yeah. um, you, you what's your prep like? Washing okay, well, it down okay, with well, alcohol? Do first. Uh, well, that, that's actually two or three steps down. What I do on these kind of rocks is I take some, some 4 aught steel wool, you know, the real fine steel wool, and get off fingerprints, um, blemishes, because, you know, things do tend to dull up a little bit. And so the uh, I find that the, just a real quick wipe down with some, some fine steel wool kind of brings out the shine a bit better. Mm. And then I would take some 99% some isopropyl, wipe it down, get all the, you know, whatever fuzz comes off of it, you know, mm -hmm. um, whatever dirt I've generated, wipe that down, and then put it in alcohol overnight to make sure yep. that there's no, you know, just a bath. Mm -hmm. And I would put it in the oven for about two hours at, at 225 just to evaporate out any moisture. And then uh, while it's hot, take it out. I, I do that in my oven or kitchen oven. 
taking the garage, let it set for about an hour, let it cool down while it's still a little bit warm, then that's when I spray it. That's, see, everyone has their own recipe. Well, that, that seems to work for me. I mean, I've done that with every rock and it seems to be very successful. You added the, the secret ingredient. I love raisins and everything. You just no. added the raisins. <laughs> You okay. spray it while it's still warm. It a little bit warm, not hot. Yes, yes. Not it hot, just a little warm because when it gets cool, it's going to start condensing moisture again. Uh, and then you're going to get a much leveler, even smooth. Oh, yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah. That's, that's, what I did with, that's what I did with that, that, that sphere. That's the exact process that I used on that Campo sphere I showed last week. Yeah, yeah. Same process. Um, I'm and really I, glad I, we went through the steps because I didn't I'm, want anyone just to think, oh, I have a nice piece that looks oh, good. Yeah. Let me, well, let me spray it. Um, so what I've done is I've done a lot of online research about how different people do it. And I've gotten some hints from Craig Zlyman and a few others. And uh, just kind of distilled it down into a simple uh, recipe that I follow. And, I, and I, I, I've talked about this in my videos, you know, the ones I put on your website and whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, I go through the exact same process step by step. Um, but that's about it, really. It's not that hard. It just takes a little time, a little patience. And yeah. you end up with a, just a gorgeous end product. Yeah, that, I, we, I can't wait to see. I mean, it's, it is an absolute beautiful meteorite. Um, in, in the Met Bowl, the meteorite and meteorite meteorological bulletin <laughs> database yeah um it 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 has it listed and then in, in the classification it gives it a broad classification then in the classification notes it lists it as a finest octahedron yes. it's the finest octahedron it's a uh let me see what's the classification on that it's a it's called iron ungrouped finest octahedrite uh, usually there's a a rating on it, uh, IAB or something like that, but it doesn't have anything. It's yeah, no, it's un well, it's ungrouped. It's ungrouped because it's ungrouped. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, wow. but yeah, so this is this is about as good as it gets as far as uh, etching patterns go, wooden and stone patterns. Yeah, yes. very beautiful. Yeah, worth worth the wait. And uh, just a, a note for for new fans of meteorites. Uh, we call this a partial slice. Yes. Uh, as we, as Ron showed you, the crust line on the outside, the bottom obviously is cut. That's oh, not yeah. a natural line. Just a, you know, it's a nice, nice even cut too. The guy mm -hmm. does nice cutting. Yeah. Guy uh, Mikhail Ivanov is his name. Um, he does nice work. I mean, this is the second piece I bought from him. The first one was that Marcy that I showed. Yeah. I I also etched that one, and it's evenly cut and it's nicely finished um you know he, he just doesn't apply uh, he, he, he doesn't give you any coas that's the only gripe i've got about yeah it. yeah you know, he I, did that on the other piece I, I thought that was kind of funny on your uh on your box <laughs> opening video yeah, no kept, COAs. Kept, yeah shaking the box shaking the box and nothing was falling out <laughs> yeah so so what i what i did i went ahead and i designed my own specimen card and i i, I wrote everything up on that so I'm calling this the Ron Metchus collection. So, you know, nice, so, nice. That's really good. I like that. So I'm, I'm getting up there where I can name the collection. I got 107 pieces now, or something like that. That's awesome. No, it's not huge, but for me, it's it's a significant investment. Yeah, no, no, that's nothing. To, nothing to sneeze at, man. That's a lot yeah. of space debris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ron, your uh, your collection uh, is is sizable, but. Uh, more importantly, it really focuses on quality pieces, and that. Oh yeah, I, I buy nice pieces. I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not an I'm sort of an impulse buyer, but I buy things that interest me. But they, they have to be a certain criteria. You know, um, I look at them and I, I kind of give them a uh, a rating, and but also I look for bargains. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have a lot of money to spend. So was, a lot of these I got into the deal. Some I paid full retail, but others I got some good deals on. Mm -hmm. um, that Campo, I, I looked for two years to find one. The guy was just selling it at cost. I got a good deal on that. But uh, uh, others in my earlier days before I found you could negotiate, <laughs> especially in Tucson with cash, um, you know, um, you know, some are full retail, but still they're, so they're far enough back where they, they've appreciated in value and have actually 
you know, they're actually worth more than I paid for them. Yeah, that's that's hopefully the idea behind uh, yeah. the, the the collecting. You know, the end result of, of all the of all the love and all the all the enjoyment is a nice payday at the end. Just like collecting baseball cards, coins, oh. comic books, antique oh, no. cars, whatever. My, my biggest concern is when I will these to my kids. Hopefully, they have enough sense to not just give them to some museum somewhere for free. Yeah. Just to put my grandkids to college, literally. Yeah, yeah that that's. Uh, can you ensure a media right collection? I Is there a way to ensure a media yeah. right? Yeah, it's, it's you absolutely can. ridiculous. Little, little yeah, spending, but uh, I think you can. You can, but it is considered a specialty collection sort of yeah. thing. It's extraordinarily difficult to get them to pay off if you do have a problem and they won't have a clue about what things are actually worth. And the last time I checked into it, the insurance premiums were uh, north of 10% of declared value of the collection oh, per year. Well, let me, oh. let me update you guys because I have looked into it. <laughs> uh, it is absolutely, I, I'm not a gambling man. But I'm a gambling man of certain things. <clears throat> In order to ensure a private collection of meteorites, it the premium with all state is 25% of the value Whoa. per year. Wow. And wow. in order to get that value established, you must hire a professional. And sometimes they only recognize professionals like there are a lot of professionals in our friend group, our peer group, that could probably price out a collection of normal pieces. The rarities, the historical stuff may need some work, but they tend to want to hire someone with a university background, a, a curation background, a Jeff Notkin or someone like that. And the price tag for them to walk in and take a an full inventory and spend a week and a half playing with your collection is north of ten thousand dollars you know it's just not worth it so you're yeah. you're you're basically gambling that every four years every media you you own is going to be stolen yeah so you I just could uh, approach christie's auction house with several really rare and historical pieces and say i want to put these on your auction site I'm sure you could. They're an auction house. I've never interacted with them myself. I guess they get 15% of the total total price, but uh, who has a collection like that, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I do. We were talking about um, getting deals on meteorites and also, you know, I, I'm a dealer. Um, so if you want a meteorite, feel free to hook me up. But <laughs> I also call out to my friends too. Um, so Mark Lyon, is a good friend of mine. Um, see those boxes, right? That that I top guess. box, that top box right there. I can't tell you what's in it. I can't show you what's in it, but it's Mark Lyons' material that I'm working on a project. So I, I do want to give a little shout out to him. He has a bunch of expensive and rare, hard to get meteorites <clears throat> listed on eBay that are closing this weekend on Saturday. I think I think it starts Saturday at 11 o'clock. Um, so it doesn't hurt to throw lob a bid out there. You may win some, some, uh, some rare items. Like there's one uh, on there, uh, just to give you an example, uh, uh, Udai Station, it's a silicated iron. Uh, I think his piece is like 75 grams and that's the 700, that, $800 piece just up for auction. So if you're lucky enough and, and there's like probably 12 pieces of, of rare and, and expensive slices. So pick your piece and lucky bidding. That's all I can Over. say. I just purchased a 13.87 gram Ben Cubbon from Mark Lyons. Oh, wow. That's yeah. A one of one. <laughs> I think I need to talk to a therapist. <laughs> no. Um, talking about uh, viewership and, and subscriptions, 
No, we weren't. Where did that come from? <laughs> but I will tell you this. Um, who here thinks that the, the Topher Spin Meteorite channel on YouTube gets more than 24 hours of views per day? Does anyone think it gets over 24? Okay, we got... I, I won't bet oh, against yeah, that. definitely. Okay. O over 30? Over 40? Sure. O over 50? Yeah. How about every day, 60.2 hours wow. nice. of content are consumed? Excellent. That's wild. That, that's why I named my YouTube channel uh, the Knowledge Bolide because it's 60 hours of knowledge of meteorites. It, it is not mumbo jumbo science. It's not backyard science tree talking about quasi mechanics and quasi crystals and nano diamonds the size of your fist. And I found the first 80 pound lunar in my backyard. This is real science, real meteorites and stuff like that. So I do want to, um, Thank you. Getting a little bit of round of applause. So, um, sure. I, I do want to take this time to remind everyone uh, to subscribe. It helped. It would really help me out. Um, I think right now we should take a little break and check in with one of our international friends. What do you guys think? Sounds good, Topher. But oh, just to be it. fair to quasi crystals, those are a real thing, and they are found in meteorites. Teach me. <laughs> That's probably a good topic for next time. I was reading yeah. an article well, about that a couple months ago. Well, they found uh, the first quasi crystals, I guess, I don't in know. meteorites. I don't know what that is, <laughs> um, but I will tell you this: <clears throat> we had meteorite classifier and PhD student at Florida State, um, Daniel Shake, uh, on with us one day, and w I was talking about some of the science garble that gets vomited at me daily from from rock hounds and one of the terms that they always use it had nano diamonds and he laughed and chimed in and says hey guys you know just to let you know you can't even see nano diamonds with an electron scanning microscope you need better equipment than the electron scanning microscope to talk or to see nano diamonds that's nano they're freaking small <laughs> uh, so anyone who comes to me talking about nano diamonds or quasi crystals or quantum this or when i dropped it all the lights in my house went off that's that's, that's not for this channel guys <laughs> so let's do a pause real quick and we'll check in on our videos <clears throat> all right oh i gotta push play there we go. You guys get the full effect now. <laughs> so uh, our show is going to have a little bit of an international flair today. And uh, I, I, like I said, I don't really want to change up the, uh, the flow or the pattern or, or what we're doing here. But I always invite our international friends to participate. So if you're able to make a quality video and work with me on it, um, I will, I will definitely work with you to get you featured. Right now, we actually have three, uh, Marco, Maxime, and a new one, Andre. So uh, Andreas checks in from the Netherlands and just has some amazing stuff. Um, but first, we're going to check in with Maxime. Um, and he's, he's from Brussels, but he's not in Brussels right now. So... Um, there are a few meteorites on the screen. Can anyone name uh, this one right here? Can you guys see my mouse at all? This one right here? Very famous carbonaceous from Mexico. All right. Well, we'll find Hello. out. Allende. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Maxim here. I hope you're all doing great. Today for this week's Hangout, I wanted to show you some other microscope pictures I've taken. Also, I've heard some of you wanted to know which microscope I am using. And unfortunately, I am not home this week and I had to do this video on the go with previous footage. So I will make a complete setup video for next week. Anyway, let's begin with the first meteorite I wanted to show you. 
Okay, so the first one I wanted to show you is that little slice of Allende. Let's have a look at it through the microscope. So Allende is a legendary CV3 meteorite, and on these images you can clearly see the chondrules and some CAIs, typical for the Allende meteorite. So two CAIs are the oldest solids we have here on Earth, with an age of slightly more than 4.5 billion years, and it's absolutely incredible to be able to touch that. Also, you can see those yellowish metallic inclusions, and those are very probably troilite, the yellow color being caused by the sulfur present in troilite. That's cool. Next is this very strange shaped aletai, a 3E anomalous iron meteorite with high gold and iridium concentrations. I have no idea what the initial fragment from which this slice comes from looked like, in any case I find it very cool. Also, you can clearly see the Whitman statin patterns on it, and it almost looks like they are 3D shaped, what makes them even more beautiful. As I recall, those Whitman statin patterns forms as Tainite, an iron nickel alloy, cools down very slowly during millions of years, and this allows camasite to separate from Tainite and crystallize along Tainite's crystallographic planes. The more nickel there is in the initial alloy, the widest the pattern. Next is this modest 6 grams main mass of NWA 11346, a CM anomalous carbonaceous chondrite. This one is particular because it was very close from becoming the first ever CM3 meteorite. This is due to the lack of phyllosilicates in its composition. Phyllosilicates are typically observed in CM chondrites and are a sign of aqueous alteration. And this is why CM chondrites always are classified as CM1 or CM2 or CM12. Here, the lack of phyllosilicates is an anomalous feature, hence the CM anomalous classification. That's pretty cool to have a main mass. Then, as last week, I just wanted to show you some other pictures without any comments, again, just to admire the beauty of me, right? check. Mm. 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 Oh, an Indonesian palisite. Japara. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, that's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the various pictures. And as I said, I will show you the setup I am using next week in another video. And also, I hope I will be able to join you live. So, see you next week and have a great hang out. Thanks, it looked yeah. like he had a nice blue hibonite in that piece of uh, Ishaevo, too. Yeah. You know, it was. Uh... Let me, I wonder if I can find that how quickly. I think it's. Amaldanga. Or check. In which one? The, the picture of the Ishaevo he had. Yeah. Towards the end. There we wow, this is this has such a delay. This is such a delay. I don't know if I can actually get there, but um, that is awesome. And Maxine gives us great information every single time. So super, super happy about that. Uh, and he's going to hopefully Hi, whoops, he's going to hopefully join us uh, live in one of the upcoming weeks. Um, so now we have uh, Marco checking in, and let me see here. Marco uh, sh discusses and shows something that I have asked Pat about, I don't know, six times, triple junctions. And there is a beautiful example of triple junction crystals, uh, and he's going to describe it and show us some microscope work. Hello guys, hello from Germany. Today I prepared a nice oriented meteorite and you will see that um, 
this time it's not a chondrite, but um, most probably a urolite. So let's have a look on it. Okay, guys, and here it is. The piece weighs 203 grams, and we're now looking on the front side of the piece. As you can see, we have two regions. One region shows the initial surface with flow lines and the other part of the piece is a little bit broken. But I think that's not so bad because we have now the possibility to look inside the piece. And that's what we will do later on. We're going under our microscope and we will have a look on the internal structure of that piece. Yeah, that's the trailing side of the piece and it shows the common features for oriented meteorites. So a frothy fusion crust, some signs of roll overlapping. On a urolite. And as you can see, the crust here is more preserved than on the front side. So I guess that this was the part of the stone which was buried in the ground of the desert. It froze for a second there. Hold on one second, guys. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> okay, guys, the microscope is. Why does it keep doing that? I have that microscope. Hello, guys. Hello from Germany. Sorry, guys. Difficulties scientific or technically here. So let's just replay that a little bit right there. Okay, guys. The microscope is prepared. So let's have a look. To the internal structure of that stone. Okay guys, we're now looking on the fracture surface on the front side of the piece and as you can see we have here a very coarse grained crystalline structure with mostly opaque um, crystals but also green translucent crystals. Yeah, lots. For me, that looks very, very urolytic. Very much. And that's the part with the flow lines on the front side. Man. Also here you can see those nice crystals. And also that coarse grained structure. That looks much like my Eurolite main mass. No, I mean, not fusion crust, but structurally. Now I turned the stone around and we're looking on the trailing side of the piece. There are also some uh, fracture surfaces which show the same crystalline structure as the front side. But of course, there are regions with an extreme frothy oh. and bubbly fusion crust. Look at that. Jeez. That's beautiful.
So the stone is definitely oriented. And yeah, what are your meaning, guys? Do you agree? Is it a euro light or something else? It, it looks a lot. Here now I doubled the magnification to have a closer look on the crystalline structure. Is that a Barlow lens he's using and on his main objective? It's really a nice material. We'll have to get him to comment on it. Especially on the green boundaries of the crystals, on the single crystals, we have uh, an enrichment of carbon. And in some cases, or in, in, yeah, in very common cases, this carbon is in the modification of diamonds, but nano diamonds. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, urolites are very, very hard materials, very hard to, to cut and very hard to polish and grind. And that's because of those nano diamonds on the grain boundaries of those crystals. Yeah, here you can see a nice green translucent olivine crystal. <clears throat> yeah, and that's no lava. <laughs> that is the frothy fusion crust on the backside. Wow. Looks like soft serve ice cream almost. <laughs> On this sketch, I want to show you the common crystal arrangement in urolites, the so called triple junction. Yeah, and here you can see a triple junction in the urolite, and as you can see, the grain boundaries are filled with material and that's exactly the place where you will find those nano diamonds. That is a great Okay example. guys, that was the piece for today. I wish you a fantastic hangout. Have fun guys and see you next week. Bye bye. Thanks Marco. Wow. Yeah, these guys put a lot of uh, a lot of time and effort into their uh, into their their videos and the the knowledge uh, is part of the uh, knowledge bolide so really appreciate uh, marco taking the time to make that video as well now this one sit back relax grab a drink we're going on a 12 minute tour uh -oh. of uh of a collection of andras uh he will tell you but he focuses as you can see on Falls and European stuff. So let's, and I love his shirt, by the way. <laughs> Hi all, this is Andries from the Netherlands. I would like to show you a small video of my collection. I hope you like it. Please enjoy. Great display cabinet too. In my display cabinet I have meteorites from all over the world. Although my main focus are European specimens. As you can see, a nice hassle. To the left a very nice unclassified one. A very cool one. Amber, the name of my daughter. <laughs> it's nice. <clears throat> this one right in front of you is in classification right now should be 
approved soon. Nice. So nice Morasco, Poland. Ooh, the V-class. Nice Dronino, nice Tornberg. We're going to see a bunch of stuff that we don't get to see very often. This one's for Cameron. Bye, Slice the moon hanging out. This one's also nice. Sadly broken. But we very nice oriented one. Another one of my favorites. Oh, Two and a half gram of Krasnoyarsk. That's the original. First palisade, I think it was. My nine and a half gram lunar. And that's that's beautiful. Looks like uh, eleven two seven three. A spec of Shashingi <laughs> with British Museum label too. Mm. A lot of these I've never heard of. I know. Yeah. Look at this slice back there. Uh -huh. My two Netherlands meteorites, the Juden is a real speck, and Utrecht is, as you might know, Tover's birthday stone. Yes, it is. <laughs> My biggest slice, 911 grams, NWA869. God, that's beautiful to have a slice like that. <laughs> oh. I need it. I need to ask him if that's a cast. It has to be a cast, or else he would have highlighted. This one's a cast. Oh, okay. Middlesbrough. Yeah. Middlesbrough. Yeah. Middlesbrough. yeah. Okay. I was gonna say there's no way. Yeah. That's Another cool one. Really cool. Caroline, the name of my wife. <laughs> that's awesome. And wife and daughter. A French meteorite you might have heard of. Hmm. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> 1492 Ensign. So overall I really like this. Of course you're never done. <laughs> but for now, this is cool. I like his maps and old labels. Oh, In my drawers. Tika, my birthday stone. Beautiful. Some lunars. Omaha to Sita, four different ones. That's nice. Oh, the Van Coven one, too. Fine. It doesn't matter. Omaha to Sita, that was a mixed ball. That's probably why he has most of them. Really nice ones with old labels. Those are fantastic. Yeah. Hey, uh, Raymond, if you're on, yeah, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Amaha to sit of, there was like 12 different lithographies or something crazy like that. Yes. Yeah, there was something crazy. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah. So there he, was Uralite. It was like the, the one that was kind of the most known. And then there was multiple types of Uralite. Yeah, coarse grain, yeah. fine grain. Yeah, Van Omaha Coven. Sita is uh, ac actually it's it's not correct to say multiple lithographies, okay. uh, in that it we we believe, and it, I don't think it's been completely proven, but uh, the best theory is that it was a rubble pile, yep. and uh, you know a bunch of different stuff that had 
uh, collected up into one sort of loosely held together mass, probably mostly uh, electrostatic or van der Waals forces holding it together. And, you know, because we observed it in space, uh, you know, got the trajectory and uh, predicted the place on the ground to go find it, um, we were able to put all the dots together. It's, it's a it's a fascinating thing. There's you, there's multiple uh, uh, doctoral theses in that meteorite. Yeah, yeah, and people try to collect all different types of that rubble. Um, so thanks for correcting me on the lithography. Uh, um, learning every day. Yeah, there's ordinary chondrites in there. There's instatite chondrite in there. There's uh, fine grain and coarse grain urolite and bencubinite like CB type material in there. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. And these um, part, uh, another thing that collectors really super enjoy is, is on wild display in his collection. These old labels are mm. just crazy beautiful. Priceless. Yeah. Look at that. I would love to have that. Yeah. My German ones. Ibuprofen? <laughs> oh, I think my vitamin pill. Wow, I don't have any of these. He has two Nishwenstein. I have the cast. Uh, Oh, he's got those. Oh, nice. Oh, Austria. Austria and Switzerland. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Barwell from England. My UK specimens. Walled cottage, too. Nice size walled cottage. Yeah. Also, one of my favorite ones, very small. Mm -hmm. I got this from the main mess holder, Vincent. That's and he told me I am one of three private persons in the world who has a piece of this meteorite. That's awesome. And it's in Belgium, too. Some other French. Oh, look at that. Looks like it hit a house. I told you he has a pretty wild collection. Yep. And it's so great that everybody's collection is different. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, this is a really extensive collection of European meteorites. Unbelievable. I put it on the ensign sign. Uh, this is nice too. A small piece of bitumen from the Oslo Hammerstone. Next to a piece of the hammer sound. And Mark can is extremely hard to get. I've only seen like one for sale in ten or fifteen years or something. Which one is that one? And Mark and Palisite. Mm. Yeah. Also there's Marhalati there. That's really hard as well. Yeah, that one I that's on my want list. This is crazy. He ha he has his own European museum. Yes, he does. He does. Oh, Some yeah. chilies, always good. Take them on fire. Very nice eucrite. Oh, that is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that label on top. Oh, that's Dustin. Yep. Deal. Antarctica. Mendes. 
Ooh, Misa Siderite from Poland. Is that what we're on? Hungry. As you can see, I have some sorting to do still. <laughs> Currently, I'm close to. Yeah. Man. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I hate this. We were right there. Yeah. Antarctica. Yeah, Mississippi from Poland. Wow. As you can see, I have some sorting to do still. Currently, I'm close to 150 different European meteorites. That's impressive. So I was very lucky with all the help from friends all around the world to acquire some which are very rare, and some are easily available. Yeah. Still very happy. Baskauka have the, it's a huge oriented meteor I have the cast here, but I haven't been able to get a piece. We've discussed that several times. This is a rare one too. I hope you can see it. This is the only CO3 Melbreccia classified. Total on weights 26 Jeez. grams. This slice is two and a half grams. So roughly 9% of all there is. That's like... And that was it for my drawers. Just let me focus on this one a little bit. Uh, the first one. 7 grams Sikot Alin. The one nice. that started the madness. <laughs> As I'm sure all of you have your first piece still. Really cool. Well, this is my collection in a nutshell. Beautiful. 1200 gram H5. Man. Very nice small Sikota Lin. Yeah, good. Really nice. And my biggest 1600 grams unclassified NWA. So for now that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video and have a great uh, hangout tonight with all you guys. Awesome. Bye bye. Andres, thank you, man. That was awesome. That man. was great. Yeah. I, yeah that's an amazing collection and about a thousand times more organized than mine. <laughs> well, was, I, was everyone's favorite. Uh, if anyone had favorites that they saw. Yeah. I, it's overload. Yeah. Like seriously, like if there was one that that stood out to me was the the Mesosiderite from Poland. Um, no, I I had no. Is that what it was? 
Yeah, I've yeah. seen a couple that they go, they're around. You can yeah. get one potentially. It, it's amazing how, like, he hinted at it that some of these are hard to get. And they're, you know, then he told you that's one of one. And I got this one from the main mass holder. Only three people have it. <laughs> I mean, his collection, that is years of dedication right there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and he, I like the. Over Utrecht, too, and that one is super hard to find. The total recovered mass was tiny. Yeah, I like the Liego. He had a nice one gram from Alan Carrion. He had posted it on Facebook earlier today or yesterday, I think. So was about it. Cool. And he goes over, not overboard, but he goes, he, he does it up properly. Like it was, is in the map uh, of Legal. Um, the Ensign sign had its own uh, artwork and stuff. There's maps on things, uh, old labels. Uh, everything was visible. You know, you don't have to dig through stuff. It's like, I have dreams and ambitions. <laughs> but in reality, you see the cases behind me. <laughs> so let me see here. Um, I think if I hit this, we go to the next. Oh, this is something that I did, uh, that, I, that I, I, I created because a lot of times people don't, uh, uh, haven't seen the uh, Chelyubinks bolide and the audio synced up. They've seen the bolide event in the sky. It's shooting with, with uh, dash cams with no audio. And you've also seen the, the vapor trail in the sky and you've heard the explosions, but this may be one of the first times that you've seen it put together. So I hope you enjoy this. You just feel the power of it. Headphone warning. was super cool to have it have it synced up like that that's yeah. actually one of the videos that i use in my talk to grade school kids and my wife thought it was so scary she had me turn the sound down and <laughs> some of the uh, more important more uh, glass crashing things yeah and, and they, you know, so I, I, I told them that story and they're turning they're going turn it up turn it up they want to see more <laughs> <laughs> they loved it the round sound <laughs> yeah, it's it's absolutely and and you know so the for those on on YouTube who may not know the entire story, Chelyabinsk, uh, the bolide, meaning uh, it exploded uh, about 19 kilometers, I think, in in the sky. Um, so obviously, uh, light travels faster than sound. So yeah. the optics of it was was witnessed on the ground, and everyone came to their windows and was looking out their windows at the streak in the sky. Meanwhile, the concussion wave was just rushing down on them and uh when it finally hit you saw the devastation and damage and windows being blown in yeah. um yeah it's just a shocking uh a shocking video every time i see it um so quick little plug i sell show you being shatter glass uh let's go to uh these aren't sales things but i'm just hey if, if people don't know that that you know if, if you're a collector and you want glass or if you're watching on youtube and you remember seeing the event and you think it'd be cool to have a piece of history that's also available um let's go to arthur who has something to show off for us yeah okay uh if you remember marco's uh, microscope. I was just wanted to uh, show you uh, the, the microscope. Whoa, where am I? Maybe I've got to turn it this way. And that's the uh, MBC 10 stereo microscope. And I do have a, a camera for it. It's a Nikon. Uh, 2.0 
megapixel, and I have the uh, uh, flexible gooseneck light for it. It's a uh, 150, uh, what is it, Robi, uh, something of that nature. But uh, hopefully putting it all together and be able to get some real close up detailed photos of uh, some of the textures of my meteorite. And uh, I hope at some point to share them. I have a microscope program from American Scope connected to this. So uh, I'm not used to using it. So I'm learning as I'm going. So it will take a while, but I think I'll be able to do it. Nice. I think it's important after hanging out with Pat Brown for a while, you, you realize the importance of a microscope as part oh, yeah. of your part of your enjoyment of the uh, of the sciences. Um, you, you really get to look into it, like he showed us last week, and maybe Pat. I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot. Yes, I do. Uh, if you have anything to sh <laughs> if you have anything to show off today, you you can use that. Do you have that light source hooked up again? I do. Still? <clears throat> Yeah, I, well, I, I don't have it on the microscope. I have it on my uh, on my auxiliary camera. Um, but one day, um, I will do a uh, uh, an episode on on microscopes. These are my yes, the main three that I use, and uh, also uh, and uh, Topher, your your lighting upgrade is is coming. It didn't happen yesterday, but it's. Uh, it's going to happen. I just signed up for the uh, um, for the mail picked up from your house thing. I need to ex explore it a bit more. But yeah. uh, uh, my UPS or my my USPS? It, yeah, yeah, it's uh, USPS. Um, so uh, this is a um, beautiful Type Three unclassified from uh, Matt Stream and. This currently, uh, I've got an LED ring light and the uh, 150 watt LED blaster uh, bouncing off the, the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, you really can't see very much. Uh, there's a lot of reflections. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll turn off the ring light. Yeah, that's a little better. Mm -hmm. We'll turn on. So that was a a diffused ring ring light. We'll turn on the one with the reflected cross polarized light. And so right now the polarizers are parallel, so there's no advantage. But as we rotate the polarized, so there's a there's two polarizers, there's one in the optical path and one in the light path. And as we rotate, oh, that's gonna make a liar out of me. Um, Well, it's not perfect, but uh, there with the uh, reflected cross-polarized light, uh, it cancels out uh, a lot of the surface reflections. It's doing all sorts of crap with uh, with uh, auto exposure here. Um, but all of a sudden in this type three, you can see chondrules, you can see green uh, inclusions. There's even a, a rectangular looking black inclusion there. Um, so this this reflected cross polarized light technique. So there's you know, there's with the with the polarizers parallel to each other, but it's uh, and just just to dumb it down for for people like me, um, when the um, cross polarizers are are in parallel, it lets any any light coming through go through. When you have them cross polarize, only light coming straight in goes through. Yeah, actually, so the when when you have both polarizers in there, you're it, you're not uh, illuminating with regular light. You're illuminating with linear polarized light, which is not terribly different uh, with the with the polarizers parallel to each other. But when you uh, have the polarizers at right angles to each other, then you are um, 
canceling the reflections from the surface. Yeah, I'm going to have to set it up better to show the effect. Uh, the uh, w when you cancel the reflections from the surface, you uh, uh, all of a sudden can see uh, detail that you wouldn't have seen before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really important when we were looking at it uh, in Tucson under the microscopes there. Yeah, and I have to apologize to the people who were in Tucson because, uh, uh, you know, now they're all spoiled. They're going to have to get good microscopes. <laughs> yeah. So here's one that I have shown before. This is a unclassified uh, but probable CO3. So there's with the, with the polarizers parallel. And... And all I'm doing is rotating the polarizer, I'm not changing anything else. And there, it's having trouble focusing. But uh, there you can, you know, you can actually see uh, in the cut surface of the rock um, the detail that, that was just, you know, light reflected off of the surface. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of these days I will, uh, I will do a... Uh, more content on uh, on microscopes and lighting. Um, yeah, that's been that's been asked. So that that'd be super cool to have that because you're the uh, the microscope master. So yeah, it would definitely be uh, interesting to to have. Uh, Could I ask Pat a question? Sure. On the microscope, uh, on your main objective, do you use a Barlow lens to get in really close? Like um, uh, Marco was. Uh, really deep into the texture of the meteorite? Um, no, I don't use a, a Barlow uh, lens. I use, let me turn on a little more light here. Um, I don't use a Barlow lens, but um, with, uh, with high quality microscopes, um, uh, zoom microscopes, you always have an objective mm -hmm. and um, the objectives are of different um, uh, different qualities or different properties. So uh, the normal objective for um, the Leica microscopes uh, is uh, one like this. This is a 1.0x uh, objective, and it, it thread. The, this one has a has that same reflective cross polarized light rig, but it it threads onto the bottom there. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uh, a Barlow uh, mm -hmm. specifically, but you can change uh, magnification with it. This one is a 1.0, but uh, mm -hmm. there are uh, 0.63x, um, 1.0, there's 2x as well. Generally, the main reason for this kind of uh, objective I'm sorry, I can't see if things are in focus or not, but the, the main reason for this kind of objective is to change the working distance. So the, mm -hmm. the point, the distance from the microscope to the point that's in focus. Right. Um, on the MZ-12 here, uh, I recently bought a plan APO objective. So it's plan, so it's corrected for a flat field instead of a curved field. Mm -hmm. And APO is for apochromatic, so it has color correction at three different color wavelengths rather than just uh, two, as as are on more uh, simpler objectives. But in this case, this whole thing here is the objective. Yeah. So uh, the plan has you know uh, different optical properties at the corners of the field versus the center of the field. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you can, it, it's not, not as necessary for looking through the microscope uh, first person, but it's much more important for photography. Yeah. Um, but the apochromatic not only gives you um, color correction at three different colors, but you also improve the resolution of the image. And um, so, oh, thank you, Topher, for putting me on uh I can actually see what I'm doing. Uh, the the apochromatic objective uh, significantly improves the resolution of the image as well. And so uh, I've got this one set up uh, with reflected cross-polarized light. And then I also have uh, 
uh, a light in the bottom uh, of this one and I've dropped a polarizer in there and I've, and I've got a polarizer I can put on, on here so I can do transmitted polarized light as well. Um, what I'm having but, difficulty with is the uh, focusing in of the true colors of the texture of the meteorite. Uh, you know, it's like that histogram in which you can go in and you can, you can compensate for, but I don't know if I like that too much because I don't want to fudge around with the photo because I'm not presenting it in a true sense. It's what right. I'm thinking that appeals to me when I'm making adjustments. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, of course, that's the dirty little secret of digital photography is you can take a whole bunch <laughs> of pictures real quick and spend hours and hours and hours messing with them. Oh. So the better that you do, uh, you know, out of the gate, the better uh, your photos are going to be, and and the more uh, the more accurate uh, they're going to be in terms of the content. Um, but I noticed on your microscope you're using a fairly simple uh, illuminator, uh, similar to this one. Um, this is a an AM scope, uh, right, right, and it's it's. Uh, there's no polarizers. It's just uh, LEDs. Just LEDs, and these are uh, quite good for many applications. But if you're looking at a slice of a meteorite, um, you really get so much light reflected off of the surface of the slice that you're not really seeing the detail, and that's mm -hmm. the reason for uh, this reflected cross polarized light setup. And, yeah. This is a fancier one that uses a, a, a uh, uh, you know, a big incandescent uh, light source with a fiber optic uh, ring. Uh, but so here's the, the inner polarizer that's in the uh, optical path and it goes inside there. And then this polarizer, uh, which is rotatable, goes on the outside so in the in the lighting path and then sorry making everybody seasick here uh and then it it clamps onto the objective and uh with by rotating that bottom polarizer you can uh get to the point where the two polarizers are at right angles which cancels out the surface reflections which allows you to see far more detail so yeah. and when you're looking through the scope you know when you get it because it just pops yeah right. yeah it's 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 the same sort of aha moment the first time somebody looks through a, a true uh, two optical path zoom microscope and yeah i uh i remember this this show like i said there's no egos on this channel this shows my <laughs> naivety when i first got into microscopes um Pat built me one, sent it to me. I set it up here at the house and I started using it. And I just, I was complaining to him because it, it's, it's looks, I mean, it's industrial. It's like 40 years old. It's like a Ugarian, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's a lead brick, but it works perfectly. But the optics, I couldn't, my, they were too wide. My eyes were too, they were my, and, and, I, and I could only look through one at a time. And I said, you know, it would be nice if I could, you know, look through both at the same time. And he's like, well, dude, they adjust. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, they were kind of frozen in place. And I, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to yank on him, but he encouraged me. And, I moved, and they finally gave and they moved freely. And once I got them perfectly aligned for my eyes and looked down, all of a sudden, um, the two images come together and pow, it's 3D. And if you've never experienced it, you're missing out. Yeah, and it, it really truly is 3D because, uh, uh, you know, a high quality uh, zoom microscope will ha has two optical paths. There's two complete sets of lenses in there. Uh, and so your the image that shows to your left eye and to your right eye are different. Yep. Uh, and so you, you really do get depth of field and, and a 3D sort of look. Yeah, I, I, it blew my mind. And yeah, it, it's, yeah, I'll never forget. I, I, when you see a chondral 
fly on the wall, I see you nodding. When you see a <laughs> chondral sticking out and then you zoom in and you actually see that it's 3D, you see the globe of it. It's like, yeah. 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 I spent three hours looking through my stereo microscope and my eyes felt like they were five feet out in front of my head and 50 grit sandpaper texture. <laughs> yeah. So this this reflected cross polarized light setup is uh, you know a dedicated Volpe uh, fiber optic ring. The polarizer, uh, the, the the polarizer inside, um, it's uh, uh, suboptimal and really expensive. Yeah. Uh, but this is the modern version of that. So this is LED lighting. Um, and this is what Topher's going to get as soon as I get my stuff together. Yes. Uh, but it, uh, it has, uh, you know, an LED light ring with a polarizer in front of it mm -hmm. and another uh, polarizing lens in the optical path and using Is that LEDs. On a 57 millimeter mount? Uh, yes, it's it's adjustable. I, I think the um, I think the um, maximum. Uh, well, I'll put it back together one handed. Uh, I think the maximum uh, diameter that can take it can take is sixty two millimeters. But mm -hmm. we'll check it uh, when when I get that all together. I'll I'll have a uh, a link. There's one guy in. Uh, Zhenzhou, China, that is uh, is selling those. It takes forever for them to get here, and mm. they're not. I'd be cheap. interested in hooking up to that link because uh, you know it's just one more aspect uh, that can hopefully make my uh, photos look better. <laughs> you know? uh, so the other the other thing that's really important uh, is the light the qualities of the light. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun is uh, the equivalent of about, of about 5,500 degrees Kelvin. And uh, the old school projector bulb um, setup can do that with the intensity turned all the way up. Yep. You know, the old school uh, setup can do that with the intensity turned all the way up, but um, the life of the bulb is, is, you know, 10, 20 hours that way. The, and if you turn down the intensity, it goes yellow. Uh, but with LEDs, with the right LEDs, um, the, uh, color temperature is, is 5,500 degrees Kelvin and you can dim it and you still get the same color temperature. Uh, and so anyhow, th this is, a, this is a, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> detailed I, depth subject. So at some point in the future, I'll arrange with Topher to do a more thorough. Yeah, you know, he's our, he's our deep dive guy for sure. And we've been talking about that for, for a while. So Pat, let, let's definitely close loop on, on that and, and, and bring that to fruition and give, give a little bit of, uh, of uh, presentation on that. Uh, let Got me hit pause. Pat. Yeah. Yeah. And Arthur, thanks for showing your, uh, your scope as well. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Okay, let me hit pause one second. All right. It's now time for some show and tell, and we're going to throw it over to Michael Kelly. There you go, Mike. Hey, how's everyone doing? So I showed um, this piece last week. This was a little bit of a high metal Winonite. Um, and when I had gotten it, it was uh, kind of field prep to make sure it was high metal, uh, which it was. But, uh, you know, they kind of took it to the, I'm guessing, belt sander, you mm -hmm. know. And it was uh, it was nice and curved on the front. It probably had about a uh, yeah. <laughs> a millimeter of doming going yeah. on between the edges and the middle of the face. Uh, so it it got uh, taken out to the lap, uh, mm -hmm. and yesterday got uh, lapped, oh, brought yeah. flat. Yes, mm -hmm. and then I took it and I etched oh. it. Oh, nice! So uh, there's uh, Whoa. there you can wow. see that. The metal with all the nice little crystal week. grains sitting in there, then, uh, yeah, which, that, you know. That's stunning. Yeah, mm -hmm. I haven't taken uh, the, the finished weight on it. You know, I, I probably lost a, a couple grams, but I think it was uh, uh, was well worth uh, 
was well worth the diet plan in order to get it looking the way I wanted. I'll yeah. tell you, Mike, uh, it, as much as it hurts, because I know the cost of the material to lose that weight, you brought that piece to life. Yeah. yeah. So that was that's, uh, sitting, there, sitting there with the other pieces. And then I just wanted the, uh, the uh, kind of the other one I had was uh, this is one that I got from you, Topher. Um, yes. And I yeah. had specifically bought it because I wanted a, a piece to kind of work on prep for. Um, so this is one uh, that you had that was a, a rough cut piece um, and brought it up. It's not 100% done yet. I got to bring it probably about to 3,000. Mm -hmm. um, but it had nice metal in it. And I, I like the piece just because the uh, kind of, I don't know if it's dual lithologies or uh, just differential weathering, mm -hmm. you know, and it was kind of sitting like this yeah. and, and weathered down and the core stayed the way it was. Um, but uh -huh. I, I thought the look was really interesting with those two kind of um yeah. lighter spots in there and then the rest mm -hmm. of it almost looks either shocked or uh or or differentially weathered those yeah. two <laughs> those two pebbles uh those two brecciations that you're seeing were <laughs> throughout the entire piece nice yeah. and and that's not differential weathering if you'll notice the crack that goes across the lighter colored uh lithology there uh, mm -hmm. there's no weathering around that so um, I, I think Great you're point. looking at real brecciation. I don't think, I don't, I wouldn't okay. call that weathering. Appreciate it, Pat. Yeah. I mean, it was just, uh, I was kind of looking at it and I, I couldn't tell really if it was one or the other. So yeah, but yeah it's, it's great to get another opinion on it. Yeah. Nice. It's good. It's good to see one of my pieces again. Slice, yeah. 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 I mean, like I said, it was, it was, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's thin too. It was nice. And you know, you know me, I'm, you know, this is this is my usual, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so big, bigger full slices aren't what I usually do. That's beautiful. I love seeing a I love seeing a piece again after it's uh, sold, but in someone's collection, it still lives on. Um, for for those of you that uh, saw the video, um, uh, I put it on Facebook and YouTube about quartzite. I spent a lot of time <clears throat> with uh, Johnny Tombstone, as I call him, uh, John Humphreys. And uh, at this point in time, I really want to say, uh, John Humphreys, thank you for nothing. Nothing, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I now am a proud owner of nothing. Arizona. Um, it's weird because, like, how do you weigh nothing? <laughs> I, I have 0. 0.92 grams of nothing Arizona, and it's because of my good friend John Humphreys as a gift. Um, after we hung out for the weekend, uh, we both gifted each other something. Uh, he gave me this. And I gave him a, uh, a piece of the NASA um, space shuttle cord. Um, so without further ado, here is my Mike Kelly size piece of Nothing Arizona. Way cool. A, a harder, rarer one to get. Um, I remember when Dr. Garvey mm -hmm. was taking us on his tour, 9.2 grams, or mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 0.92 grams <laughs> when he was taking us through the tour of the uh, of, uh, Center for Meteorite Studies vault. He talked about Nothing Arizona and how he submitted the name to the nomenclature committee and really, really was hoping they'd approve it because he loved the name Nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can see some pattern in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm told it etches. John says it etches really well. But after my debacle last week, Ron, I'm not in a hurry to touch this thing with acid. <laughs> it may just dissolve away to a gaseous state. It's pretty small. Yeah. It's it's pretty small, but check out the uh, you can still see the oh yeah the crust on it. Actually, yeah. I've been looking for a piece of nothing for a while. I may have found one. Some you know. And has it got rollover lips on it? No, Roll but I I think I'm I think I'm going to pay someone who knows what they're doing to polish and etch it for me because that 
that would be a this 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 side needs work too. But I wanted to wanted to do a nice little shout out to my buddy John for for hooking me up with that. And just so we all know, <clears throat> there's the information again. You can do a a pause if you're not live. Mm -hmm. And the name of his <laughs> his company is Arizona Meteorites or AZ Meteorites. So I definitely appreciate, uh, definitely appreciate that. Um, Where is nothing Arizona located? Um, there's in nothing the around there. Nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. Yeah. Um, this is going to be a identification game. Name this meteorite type and what it is. It is a witnessed fall. I'll give you that. Hmm. Nice crust. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the inside. Uh, it looks L6 ish. Nope. This is going to give oh, it away. There you go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's going to give it away a little bit yeah. more. Look at it on my fingers. See how it's fragmenting and friable? Mm -hmm. Acron Dritic, and I see some olivine uh, crystals. Is that Jonestown? This is not Jonestown, but it is a witnessed a diagenite. It's Holly Town. And I love the crust on it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Overcooked meth. <laughs> this is Belanga. Oh. So this is so glad I quit <laughs> Belanga. It's a uh, achondrite uh, diagenite. It uh, was witnessed in 1999, October 27th, and I have nearly three grams of it. And you can see by my fingers, it's very friable. Yeah. Every time you touch it, you lose material. So you have probably seen that be touched for the last couple times. And you know what I'm going to do with that, right? Oh, you lick that. <laughs> Eat as much meteorites as you can daily. So that is one of only, I think, <clears throat> 11 um, witnessed diagenite falls. It was... Uh, um, Tatooine and um, Belanga and Johnstown. <laughs> um, this is another witnessed fall that I'm starting to really appreciate a little bit more. Um, this is Churgach. <coughs> now it, it's uh, just an ordinary chondrite H5, um, fell in Molly. 2007, and this is what the normal Turgatch looks like. I mean, it's a nice one, but this is what you're normally looking at. Um, fresh fusing crust, but there's no flow lines. Um, no signs of orientation necessarily, maybe just a rounded edge right there, but the interior is very grayish, non uh, nondescript. It's classified as what uh, as an H five, yeah. So there's heavy metal, but I think that might actually be a metal vein right there. Certainly, some blebs uh, visible. Yeah, um, some um, blebs metal in the crust too. It looks like yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, so this is this is the normal Churgatch. <clears throat> and the reason I'm showing this off is so you can, yeah, this is a nice PC. It does have real good fusion crust. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I'm showing this one off so you can identify a typical Churgatch. So you can really appreciate this slice. <clears throat> this is 
a uh, 12 and a half gram slice as well from Jensen Meteorites. Um, this is wild. Ah. Look at the metal in it. Look at the melt in it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's... That's pretty stunning. That is... Uh, yeah, the best I've I've seen. Wow! Well, look at the the uh, the undisturbed stuff has bigger blebs of metal, and the melted flowed stuff is much smaller blebs. Yep. And I don't know, <clears throat> maybe Mike Kelly, you can mute yourself, please. Uh, yeah. Then you have this area here. Maybe I can. Point it out. <clears throat> Is it right there? Mm -hmm. No, nope. this one right here. Yeah, there's some porosity in there. Yeah. Hold That's on wild. Let me pause this. Okay, we're recording. Not guilty yeah. this time. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like this time, but we found we found and muted the culprit. <laughs> Yeah, this, as soon as I saw this, I was like, I must have that. Because I have <laughs> a lot <clears throat> of Turgach, but I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, that's a problem a lot of us have, you know, unless you've got a really good poker face when you see something that you must own. It puts you at a disadvantageous position in, yeah. in terms of negotiating. Wow. Just a beautiful meteorite, man. The the melt on this one is almost um I brought another I brought another melt just to show you the difference because this is an H5, but it's mm -hmm. obviously undergone some tremendous melting. I have another <clears throat> H5 but this is actually classified as an H5 melt. So this is uh, wow, tacit. Wow, <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. That almost looks like tacit. Yeah, but it very, is very, very different. It doesn't have those islands of unaltered material with the rivers of melt around it. Tacit that 004. Correct. Very yeah. good, guys. Yeah, the typical blobby sort of uh, appearance on the outside. It's exactly but, like what I have. Maybe a sister's sister piece. Yeah, nice metal. I doubt it is. I bought the entire stone and cut it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine has the same general shape. That's the weird thing about it. Those those linear metal blebs in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually cut this myself, and it's. It's straight. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. When Mike said I gave it to him in, in you know, rough form, dude, that was my finished form. <laughs> 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 I told you, man, I'm not an artist. Oh. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I figured this would be interesting to look at, too, because they're both H5s. Mm -hmm. One is classified as a melt right here and one is not a melt but not classified as a melt but obviously is tremendously melted mm -hmm. right yeah and that's you know that's another interesting point that 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 meteorites are very often not completely homogeneous through and through and that's particularly important when you think about what uh type sample and what slice for making thin sections you're going to send to your classifier um yeah. You know, there's, there's a temptation to use the, well, that one's already cut off, but it's over 20 grams. Um, but that's not necessarily the path yeah. to get uh, a good classification. If done. I had, if I had a chance or choice of which one, I'm, which part I'm sending in for classification, the answer is both. Yes. I, and this one, you, you'd be doing a disservice to, to science to give them only parts that have melt, knowing that the vast majority is going to be represented, represented like this. So in this case, you would want to make note that 
some samples show extreme melt and then give them a sample of both. Is it right, Pat? Yep. Yeah. Right on. I didn't want to step on your toes. No, no, that, that's that's right on. And that, yeah. that's an excellent point that you raised. Thank you. Now, oh. there, there is one <laughs> thing that I just got that I don't know what it is. Hey, Topher? Yep. Hey, quick question for you. What saw do you use? Uh, I have a uh, uh, a rock. No, oh jeez. Rock <laughs> No, I I have the same one that other people have. Oh my god, I can't remember it right now. Ray yeah, tech? it's a high. Yes, thank you. It's a it's a high tech um, six inch. High oh, tech okay. Time. High tech diamond six inch. I've been and, thinking about getting one. I just was curious what everybody else is using. Yeah, um, uh, we can have a whole discussion about saws. Uh, that's a yeah. whole. That's a whole hangout itself. Um, depending on how big of samples you're going for. Um, hold on. Depending on how big of specimens you're going to be cutting, is going to be a lot determined of what size saw you you get. And then what type of samples you're going to be cutting. Are you going to be cutting $100 a gram Mars or 70 cent a gram ordinary chondrites? Yep. Um, it, it's really going to depend on what type of saw, whether it's a wire saw or just a, a diamond uh, kerf saw. Um, so there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, and then one thing that, you know, I was bragging about getting this thing. And you guys, I mean, laugh all you want, man. That's, that's straight. Okay. Yeah, that's, it's beautiful. That's straight, okay. <laughs> it ain't going to happen very often for me. So when, <laughs> when, when it comes along, I have to, I have to show it up. So you have to find a way to feed the rock every single time in, in a parallel way mm -hmm. while holding a rock that is all nobular and stuff. And if it's a, a one with fusion crust, you're not wanna, you don't want to crank down on it with a vice. So you have to find creative ways to hold your sample. So for me, it's hand holding and eyeball. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's really a, a understand your use case, like Topher's saying. Then the next step is look at blades and get to understand blades uh, with, with, the four inch blades, you can get down to an eight thousandth of an inch thick blade, but you're not going to run that in a 10 inch saw and you're not going to run that at a low speed. So, uh, yeah, like, like Tupper says, it's a whole nother discussion, but, um, but yeah, look at saw blades first, by the time you get up to 12 inch blades, there's no thin 12 inch blades. Yeah. Um, Perf's always thick. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, just so it's out there. We're always talking about blade sizes and we're always talking about um, even numbers, six, eight, 10, 12. If anyone's talking about odd numbers, they're not talking about lapidary. And we're only talking about lapidary saws. We're not talking about rip saws or things you have in your garage. So. Tile saws. So, so I made up uh, a little device that can go in the vise on a saw, but there's a threaded bolt that sticks out from the side and I put some cyanic uh, super glue on, on the head of the bolt and then I place whatever the rock or whatever I want to cut so that I can feed it into the saw. I don't have the piece, uh, the jig that I have right now, but I will have it next time. And it allows you uh, to feed the meteorite at a at a reasonable rate so you don't burn out the motor and you get to see how much of a slice you want to uh, uh, cut from your specimen. Yeah. But I don't have a lot of meteorites that are large enough that I can cut a bunch of slices <laughs> from. <laughs> yeah. And, and honestly, um, I, I would love to, once my, once I get my garage set up, I need to, I need to get a waterproof little, uh, shower curtain area set up for my saw and stuff just so I can go nuts with the with the water and not worry about it but once I get that set up I do want to include cutting into the hangouts I we can always just pause I'll take my camera out in the garage we'll cut something we'll take a look at it I see Steven Amara online so, uh, so 
Uh, so I'm, hey, I'm sure Steven. we can. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. No, that's all right. Yeah, we Thank so you, we could always do another uh, cutting session with Amara because, um, again, depending on how much you want to do and how much you want to invest and how much space you have and how important for me, just ripping something, getting a look at the inside is good enough. Getting a sample off for a lab is good enough. I'm not doing precision cuts for clients. And I'm definitely, like we discussed in the uh, Eurolite video earlier, because they do have nano diamonds. Um, I was not about to try to cut that myself. No way at all. I paid, um, okay, I, I, I sent it out. I had a piece cut off for Oz. We miss you, buddy. Um, and then I had uh, five or six slices made. So that's six or seven cuts, and the bill was three hundred dollars. So nice. it's expensive, hard material to work with, and so that's why when you see a Eurolite slice for sale, um, just know that there's <laughs> a lot, a lot of extra expense in the actual prep work for that material because. There's six and a half hours of cutting <coughs> in six and a half cuts, just about. It's an hour per cut. And when you see the slices, I mean, they're only like that big. They're not, it's not a massive stone. We're not cutting through feet of stuff here, you know? <laughs> so uh, Amara did uh, some cutting, uh, I think two weeks ago or whatever. If you do the search on the YouTube, on my YouTube channel, you'll find it. He has a really nice gravity fed um, system, a weighted system uh, that he dials in the actual uh, millimeter of thickness of the slice. And we're going to get again and we're going to get him again to do a, a cutting demonstration for us. So uh, well, hopefully that'll, it. what's that? Oh, Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll have to get him. We're going to get him scheduled ahead of time uh, and he can do some cutting for us. Um, I noticed that Arthur, you have your hand up. Did you want to show something still? Uh, yeah, I have the uh, Belanger there. That's an 8.9 gram. Oh, that's Belanga? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, and it has some nice crust on it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And I looked at some of the lighter Beautiful. surface underneath the crust, and I'm seeing signs of lamination. You know, it, it, it's like whatever the material is, it, it looks like it's laid down uh, in, in like laps or, you know. Uh, Almost like a, uh, like a mica feel to it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I, yeah th that's that's uh, known with um, Belanga. Yeah. So I don't want to handle it too much. I want to put it back in its nice little cradle. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. I'll have a lot of sugar pieces to pick up. Yeah, that's awesome. I and I think that's another one that I uh, held at one point in my life. Yes, I was going to say. I think I purchased this from you because it came with a nice metal metal tag. I know yeah. you're seeing it backwards, but <laughs> no, it's good. It's good for us. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's awesome. I remember that piece. It had a, it has really good fusion crust on it, yeah. and it does. I know what you're talking about, and it's hard to describe. It, it yeah. looks like peeling of layers, almost like um, mica. Uh, is it mica? Is, uh, yeah, the, like yeah. a bezel, yeah. bezel cleavage or a bezel yeah. part. So. Um, I want to I want to do the uh, the last item of show and tell today because um, I, I think it's it shows you that we're studying and we're trying to educate ourselves and scientists are dedicating their lives to it, but we're it's always on a, a on a quest and the end goal the the goal line keeps getting moved sometimes. So here I have a package that I got from. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Shen. Uh, so Yang sent me this, um, and it is it is labeled as a hexahedrite. 
which is a rare iron. Mm -hmm. When I first opened it up and looked at it, I, I never want to call, I never want to second guess uh, a doctor, especially when this is what they do. I mean, he is a doctor in the earth sciences at, at uh, USC. So, but I will tell you that I, I'll show you the iron side first. Ooh. Damn. That's sweet. Yeah. Wow. You can see pa some pattern in there. Yeah. In the back. <laughs> and then in the front, you have some nice, hold on, let me see if I can get it. In the front, you have these nice bands right here. Yeah. Is that, it looks like a little granulation on the, yeah. on the, in the back, in the back or in this right here? Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. It really, um, I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit. Not sure if it's, yeah, it's going to work, but yeah, it's definitely etched. It, it takes a different etch, a different pattern. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Look at on here. We have a leading edge that's different. It matches this, this, and this yeah. match. But in the middle, we have these long crystals. Oops, I yeah, I can't look and point at the same time. Yeah, no, I I can see them. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. But when I first saw it, you know, what my original my initial thought was, I'm holding a palisite. It looks like a palisite. Yeah, it sort of looks like one. Yeah. 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 But that granulation is different, though. Yes. So I think, again, now everything is, until it's published, everything's hearsay. But mm -hmm. supposedly someone mm -hmm. is getting, come on, there we go. Supposedly someone with the same material, uh, are you going to focus or not? There we go. Mm -hmm. um, someone with the same material sent some of it to a facility. I'm trying to be as generic as possible, guys. Um, someone sent some material to a facility and got it tested. And the polymetry data came in as not only Palisite, but Eagle Station. Oh, boy. Wow. What? Whoa, that's crazy. So I don't know what I have. But whatever I have, I am extremely generous to Yang for sharing it with me. This I'm a very fortunate man. Um, this was a gift. Um, I helped him out with some personal shopping while I was at the uh, Quartzite show. And uh, he got exactly what he wanted. And then a few days later in the mail... A mystery package arrived. I opened it up and I was like, I have no idea why I'm getting this, but I am so fortunate and lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice gift. Yeah. So close to five grams, 4.7 grams of a potential hexahedrite with leaning towards a palisite, perhaps Eagle Station. It's like, I have no idea what I have. But you better believe that the story behind it is going to add to it, you know? So let me try to do one thing here and share this. And boom. Hopefully everyone can see each other. Yep. Nice. Okay. Well, I appreciate everyone uh, joining today. I, I, I hate that I, you guys feel that I'm bringing it to an end. And we could probably go on for another hour, but uh, we're at the two hour mark and that's kind of what I've left. That's the limit, two hours, and we'll save it for next week. The rocks are going to be 4.6 billion and a week old, so we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate everyone sharing and joining today. If by all means, send me a message on what you showed and I'll include it in the write-up. Thanks a lot for joining, everyone. Right. Good night. Take Later, care. man. Good night, good night all. Have, have a good, good night, night, everyone. Take care. Night. See you, yep. Stephen. Good to see you all. Have a good one. And Sam. Sam Lopez, are you still with us? Sam. Yeah, I'm, Sam. I'm here. I'm here. Don't log off, everyone.
We we need to check in with <laughs> Can Sam. You hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. We need to check in with Sam. Hold on one oh, second. Okay. We'll, we'll do a real quick one because we already signed off. Update us on this possible carbonaceous that you found. Well, what I've heard so far is um, Daniel is collaborating with Alan Rubin right now to figure this thing out. And like you were saying earlier with um, not sending a single piece that could, you know, lead to ambiguity, I sent several pieces because not all of them look the same. Awesome. No, so, that's a that's yeah, an I'm awesome. Not, I'm not sure how the the fact that uh, yeah, Alan so, Rubin uh, is involved um, lends a lot of uh, a lot of credence to what you found. Makes it more and more intriguing. Oh yeah, Alan's the man. Yeah, so yeah. we're super excited. Yeah. I'm really really glad that I remembered to check in with you barely before signing off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, All I almost right. hit the button too. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. For real now. I'm closing it in three. See you guys. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.